Gary, thank you very much for that delightful <laughs> extra day. Do you know how much trouble you're in? I'm always in trouble. I'm always in trouble. I, did, no, I was like this when I was a child. I was, I was telling myself, why was it like? I left my religion when I was about 12 years old boy. Uh -huh. why, and I came from a very orthodox family. My family was a family of priests. Mm -hmm. And then that's where I grew up. In fact, we used to do all the ceremonies and things like that at home because that was what you were supposed to be doing. I was born in a Brahmin family in India, of course, and especially devoted Brahmin families. But uh, by the age of 12, uh, at the age of 12, I started questioning at the age of 9 or 10. And by the age of 12, I left the religion, in fact, as a boy. And uh, very quiet, I moved away. And I think uh, even that attitude of mine still persists in me. And I, I never wanted to do any experiment why, if I did not know why I was doing that. And then I wanted to understand what the limitations of the language were and so forth. And I got into troubles. I was always in trouble. And my Sorry. wife, I didn't know, how, she wonders how I survived. <laughs> Sorry, if you want anybody to stand by you in your trouble, I am there. I have to say, I, I just sat there laughing through the whole thing. I thought, yes, oh, yeah. mate, he's saying it, it's true, wonderful. So good for you, mate, and thank you very much indeed for that. But before I start making comments on that, I think, uh, as usual, let me throw things open to everybody else. Shall I kick things off? What about what's the solution to this mess? Oh, the mess. No, to my mind, you know, it's a question of uh, acknowledging uh, that human mind has some limitations of knowledge, in fact. And I think we should, we should really acknowledge that one and then say, OK, now this is how far we got. And if we really think in terms of the democratic wise, reductionism wise and so forth, uh that is uh, what we have but of course making effective models is not a bad idea because that gives us a uh, lot of applications as you can see in your solid state physics all the semiconductors and the things which you got there everything happens with effective models there's nothing wrong with it to me to my mind at least i think uh, people have to recognize that they're getting into this model structure not necessarily understanding the nature of what it is, but what we, in fact, what was that? I think Niels Bohr himself, I said, it, 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 it will tell you, physics will tell me what I can speak of nature rather than what nature is, in fact, what I can say of it, in fact, right? So, so what we can say of it, and then it gives you a, a, a mental picture for you to synthesize and uh, compartmentalize the knowledge or whatever you want to call that. And then, uh, but, but it gives you a lot of uh, analytical tools and the, uh, experimental tools which are very 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 high level in fact right most of our students go away and work with uh, very high tech companies and so forth and there's nothing wrong in training those people but claiming that we are uncovering the mysteries of the nature at the very ultimate level at the very fundamental level deeper and deeper is probably misleading uh, let, and let, we, start, we, we keep believing that we start believing what i think we, we really some some people really believe that thing especially young people come to the come to us with the hope that they can be next einstein or they can be something next and they, they can really uncover and then uh, they, they, they make name for themselves uh, so this is another thing you know the, the 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 humility to understand the nature has been replaced by the desire to become famous in fact and then find the professions and find the money, find the power. And that's really what happened to the science in the last few decades, at least. I think, I think it goes back to 1950. I think, um, yeah. I, I think that diagram that you showed was beautiful, where you have Dirac, one, yeah. you have Schrodinger, 1.011. <laughs> but, 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 but what you said thereafter was also utterly necessary as soon as you start putting a loop on and that loop doesn't necessarily mean that it's a lepton loop an e plus e minus but it could be a q bar it could be a pp bar it could be anything you're no longer in quantum electrodynamics so the fact mm -hmm. you have 10 decimal places agreement is now no longer a test of quantum electrodynamics it's a test of a model there where you're saying okay well if we have three generations it kind of works if we have four it wouldn't or two it wouldn't and you're looking at something which is which is flaky it's now it's now it's now parameter fixing. It's no longer pure. it's no longer pure. Now, not only that, but another comment: the, the thing we're talking about with the Higgs boson that we're talking about with the W and the J psi and the epsilon and all of those other things, there you're absolutely right. Something which is narrow, which is which is long lived, that's a particle. Mm -hmm. Something which is broad, like the Z, 
Yeah. That is something completely different. Now, the fact that you need one to fix electroweak unification is just a wish. It's wishful thinking. And you get into wishful thinking, and these people say it, and they expect people not to understand what you're talking about. And in fact, I'm saying this now, a lot of people will not know what I mean. But that thing is that broad. That is bullshit. There is serious crap in there. There is serious <laughs> meaning in there. That means something is wrong at the base of this whole thing. Now, I'm saying that in public, and now I'm in trouble too. But do you know what? No, no. Hell, let's all get in trouble together. <laughs> Yeah, I could use those words in my talk, but I just uh, gulped it. <laughs> no, no, right. But also the thing for the Higgs. You know, people have discovered the Higgs. And, but you know what? If I look at this as a high physicist and I can put my high physics hat on, here it is. I'm a high physicist now. If I look at that, this is something that decays to two gammas, you know, like J psi, like yep. the omega, like the epsilon, like the pi zero it's a scalar boson for christ exactly it can go to utah utah does the same thing and look at the cross section on those plots it's oh, yeah. it's orders of magnitude down on these things it's a little tiny bump yeah you know, that's supposed to be the answer to the nature of mass of the universe i call fake i call hoax i call forget about it you do not know i mean it may be it may be true no, no, but John, just, whether it's true. just a point about that. There's a yeah. lot of data massaging goes on to that, in fact. And really, nobody really knows. There are so many bodies involved in the data analysis. And they're Thanks. already told, they're already told, you know, in 2009, I gave a talk in San Diego, and I said that in two years' time, Higgs boson will be discovered. One in the audience question, how do you know that? What do you mean by that? I said, I, I'll tell you that, Kendall. I was delayed by one year because LHC went out of operation because the magnets uh, uh, quenched. For one year, they're out of operation. Exactly, they found in 2012, two years of operation, they found uh, uh, the, the, the Higgs boson, in fact. Yeah, they were looking. And you, you know, the thing is, is if you're doing so a. Much, so much is massaging going on in the data processing. So many people are involved in that one. And then the bosses will tell you, you better find the result for me. I need everything. that result. They don't get my million pound salary and like that's that. the point now now, that, now now the problem is also that remember that what's happening in, in 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 the large electron look i am one of those people i was the data massager i was the person yeah, yeah. In the programs that took the stuff out it's me i was one of them so i know how these things work now what yeah. you start doing is you start with a trigger and your trigger is you're looking for higgs you look for a trigger on two very high energy yeah. photons and you don't look at anything else. You're looking at multiplicities and numbers of events that are yeah. 10 orders of magnitude higher than your signal. And you reject those with a very sophisticated trigger. You trigger on that stuff to begin Absolutely. with. So you're already losing not 99 out of 100, not 9,999,999 out of 100. You're, you know, you're 10 nines up there before you even start. Yeah. And, and 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 at that stage, you are throwing so much away and you're looking so specifically before you even read out the data. So 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 at that stage, you're going to find something. There's going to be something there. There's going to be something there which decays to two photons, for Christ's sake. Of course there is. It's all over the place. But then to say that's the Higgs, if it was the Higgs boson, why doesn't it look much more special than it is? Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be the fundamental thing that gives mass to particles. It just looks like a little bump. But it, you know, it's totally unremarkable, other than the fact, and it's quite broad. It's quite short-lived. Yeah. yeah, and that, that's just the Higgs. There's also the Z, as you say. There's the W, which are, and you're absolutely beautifully correct. These are not physical particles. The physical particles are mixtures. The photon isn't even pure in this theory. The yeah. photon isn't even pure. This is the type photon, photon, you're no longer pure in this one. Yeah, but that's right. The photon is massless in Maxwell's equations. That's that's 150 years old. Yeah, yeah. It's ma it, it's massless because of the transformations of space and time. It's not massless because there's some group of four things: W, Z, and well, okay. I mean, that's the current theory, and yeah. people have got a Nobel Prize for it. So it would be egg on face if that happened. But this is just egg on face for a few people. It's not real. It's not physics. It's not understanding how things work. And Charlie, thank you very much for that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, indeed. I really, yeah. No, it just drives me, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit more emotional than I usually yeah. do. In this, but it, w when you're looking at literally 10,000 of the best brains on the planet, totally wrapped up in this bullshit. Indeed, indeed. 
Indeed. when they can do something useful, it, just makes me, it makes me mad. And I don't get mad very easily. It makes me very, very mad that that weight of talent is happening. I'm sorry yeah. for making that quite so well. Okay, I'll, I'll stop now and ask people to ask other questions of Cherry while I get my act together here. Sorry about that. But I, 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 very strongly about this. Anyway, what you said was great, and I, 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 I love the expose you put in there from the point of view, as you say, of just physics as it is. There was yeah, nothing that, there that was unconventional. There was nothing in there that's outside the standard model. That's just saying, as it is. As it is now, what the situation is from the inside. So, thank you for that. Thank you. So, given this attitude, do you see any justification for continuing to build higher and higher energy accelerator <laughs> facilities? <laughs> what is it? Sabina Hausenfelder, she said, We don't need any. She's a theoretical physicist, quite, uh, she was a rising star, in fact, rising star at the time. And then she, she made one statement that we don't need higher energies. Then she's already sidelined. <laughs> the establishment. I don't worry about being sidelined because I'm at, at an age, I'm good to retire and die. <laughs> so that doesn't bother me. But, you know, but no, no, the thing is, but, okay, you can build a machine, but let's be very clear. Let, let's not kid about it. You can say, okay, technology, technologically speaking, uh, otherwise speaking, we've got challenge. We can, we can great challenge, great advantages. We can do that. And then that also gives, has got some side benefits, byproducts. That's what they, again, that's what we do these days. These days, whenever they're proposing a machine, they don't simply say that they're going to give the physics result. They say, we get the physics result. By the way, we can also do the artificial intelligence. We can also do the machine learning. We can also do the, the high, high tech, this one, and so on and so forth. And if they don't do that, they don't get the funding. And uh, the same thing is happening with the ILC also. ILC is an international linear collider proposal, which has been, uh, in works for the last 15, 20 years or something like that. And now they've got a venue selected in Japan uh, if, if Japan accepts it. And then I was asked there, because I go to Japan a lot. I work a lot in, the, in that country. So I was asked, what is the purpose of that? And then when, was, when we tried to tell them, they said, yeah, OK, people are talking about the applications of, of uh, the facility, which would do more than what the conventional machines can do. In terms of this superconductivity, high tech instrumentations, this one. There's a lot goes on, in fact. You know, there is no question about it. Even for our small experiments, we use enormous amount of computing power. LHC uses computing power, and, oh God, I think topmost, highest the thing that you could ever conceive, in fact. So that really requires uh, intelligence, uh, the new technologies, new modes of doing it, et cetera, et cetera, genius. Yeah, there are things which you can get out of it. But don't promise to me that this is going to make me understand the nature at very fundamental level that we have lost already, I think. Yeah, so in a way I'm saying, maybe we don't need that, maybe that money can be better spent somewhere else, but I'm not saying it so openly. <laughs> yeah. So maybe it's possible by simulating John's uh, equations that uh, we should be able to predict some of these coupling uh, or the permutations. So right now they have no way of explaining what why the, we have these different permutations, right? They're just numbers that they they that match re, match experiment, but there's no theory behind why, for example, the coupling constant is what it is, or why we have a, the, these various permutations. Is it possible yeah. by simulating John's equations, that Maxwell's equations? That we can actually derive in simulations these phenomena that are only confirmed by the experiment, but no expl explanation for why they why they exist. Uh, maybe John is there. Maybe John would like to address that. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, uh, Charlie's already said it. Look, um, the fact of the matter is that if you look in deep in like, sorry, if you look in deep in elastic lepton scattering, then what you're looking at is the up and down quarks or the proper quarks. And what you find with those quarks, as you look at higher and higher resolution, is that um, they vanish. That the cross section is very, very low x, at very, very low momentum transfer. Now, when you go to the analyses which are made that Cherry's talking about, where you're looking at the top and the bottom quark, then you then switch and you then see all the masses in the quarks. You're talking about something where you're not really being consistent in the way that you look at the way that uh, the, the, the quarks work. 
So if I now take that hat off and I put a put a and I go back to myself, and you look at what's happening here. Look at the complexity that Sherry is exposing there of the elementary particles that are sitting in the so-called elementary particles that are sitting in the standard model. Look at the underlying complexity, which is where you begin to get only left-handed systems, not right-handed systems, where you get multiple mixing of systems, where you have a whole set of parameters, where you have where you have uh, you, we have some rules that appear in terms of the amount of mm -hmm. quarks, which are underlying all of this stuff. There, it, we're not talking about a dozen or 16, as he showed in the matrix. We're talking about more than 50 free parameters here. We're talking about an utter dog's breakfast of free parameters. Now, a proper theory has to start explaining where those things come from. But we're looking at things such as Peter's doing, or, or that I'm doing, or where we're looking at something which is far, far simpler and it's beginning to get some of that complexity out, that it's beginning to derive the complexity instead of having to put it in by hand, that is where, as theorists, we need to go. Now, as experimentalists, I have to say that what's been measured at CERN is utterly spectacular, and, and I have nothing but tremendous admiration for the, for, for the professionalism that's gone into measuring all of those beautiful curves that, that, that Charlie has been showing. But I'm talking now about theory. The theory is a dog's breakfast, and it needs to be, it needs to be fixed. We cannot as humans leave it like that it is not just not understandable it's obviously nonsense and it has been so for really quite a long time and sabine hosfeld isn't the only one by the way we should invite her to give a talk here but um i think but um th this is what we are for this is what this group is for we have to fix this we have to provide a center where we do things as they should be done and where we fix this nonsense what you're saying in terms of simulation there are things that we can do in terms of the knots that um, that um, Lou's talking about, in terms of putting particles together as flows that go around particular shapes that give rise to the quark model, that give rise to the symmetries which are shown in the 16-dimensional matrix that Carrie just shows, that has just shown. These are quite simple mathematical things that don't even require any kind of simulation, that fit into the kind of... Um, Symmetry that Peter's been showing in terms of the quaternionic symmetry that happens. Mm -hmm. there. Beautiful, simpler, elementary ways of getting to the basics of what's going on. So it's not just the simulation of my equations. My equations may or may not be correct, but um, but um, uh, and they're not easy to, to simulate. As I've said before. I mean, already simulating Maxwell's equations is hard, and these are harder. So it, but, um, but that it doesn't matter a damn. What matters is that we are improving. We are simplifying. We are looking for the fundamentals and for the underlying uh, 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 underlying nature of physical reality below the level of responding, uh, deeper than the level of this model. So uh, it's hard for me to prescribe anything. In fact, this system is uh, so much establishment, uh, which is uh, which is. For example, the, uh, we publish this monograph. Nobody wants to read this. In fact, they just want to ignore it so that it will disappear. They will go away. That's what they would think. In fact, right. And again, as we said in our book here, we are not we are not really asking we are not really criticizing anybody at all. Just the, you saw my, the tone in which I gave the talk. That's the same tone you also find in our monograph. But they would not even acknowledge that this kind of a questions are meaningful or to be asked. In fact, given that situation, I don't really think that the particle physics is going to unravel mysteries in, in, any more than what they have done so far. But they would not stop there. That's the problem. They would not stop because they don't understand any better, right? They, they're not going to say that. They would simply say we are uncovering another layer, another layer, another layer. It's like onions which you got there. How many onions which you have got there depends upon how big the onion is, I guess. So people would say we have not we are reached that. But uh, myself, myself, I, I'm not frustrated so much. But I think I had to write this book and talk about like this so that at least the younger generation, which is future generation, which is going to enter into the field, should be aware what they're getting into. I, th I think the, the uh, layers, you know, have come to the end and uh, it, building bigger colliders won't help anymore. We've got to understand what we've got much better. And I think we're in a kind of 
a bit of a Ptolemaic phase with epicycles and that we've got to get rid of that and have a more fundamental way of looking at it. And that's what they don't realize. They think if they can build more epicycles, then that's all right. And that this is what your QED calculation is. It's endless epicycles. It's, it's, it's interesting that they can actually get such a number, but it's not interesting in itself. But it is interesting that they should try to hone in on the parameters that they have and try to get better values and more secure values for them. And uh, that's especially in the case of the neutrino sector, which if we could understand that better would be a lot, you know, a lot of help. And uh, so it's, there doesn't seem to be the will to find something more fundamental, which will explain these patterns and difficulties. Uh, it seems to be that this is, this is the, the only way we can proceed. This is the only way we can think. We can't think beyond that. And, and that's what they have to do. That's what theorists have to do, is to try to think beyond that and see why the patterns they find, which are real patterns, whether they're real particles or not, they're real patterns, and to find out what's going on with those. And uh, that's what that's what I am trying to do, and John and and all of, and Lou and others, and that that that's what you know uh, it should be the message that, that that these things may not be real, but they're real patterns. If you know what well, I mean. Well said, Peter. I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah. The, the the quark model, quark pattern, is it just is we but. To put that into a quark parton context is perhaps not the case. And certainly to put it into quark gluon context is clearly has problems. It has serious problems. So you're taking something and then taking it further than it needs to go and then taking it further than it needs to go. But the patterns are still there and the patterns of the beautiful patterns, patterns of the Eightfold Way are real. And we need to explain them as theorists in terms of the fundamentals of those patterns. And I think we're starting to do that. I think we, several of us have different ways of putting those patterns into reality. Now, those patterns, we're, we're clearly at odds with one another when it comes to little details, and probably all of us are, are, are not correct, but we're, we're working in the right direction. And, and we have to find those patterns and why those patterns arise and what the nature of the elementary particles is and how they fit together and how the knots work that fit them together that's what we're for. How, how do you how do you think about virtual particles? From the point of view of the mathematics, they're just aspects of the diagrammatic expansion of writing a perturbative version of the functional integral. And so they're mathematical entities which have been made vivid by the by the Feynman diagrams. But you want them to be more than that and you get into some trouble there. As a physicist, when we're talking about virtual particles, we're sitting inside the uncertainty relation. So you're sitting in a situation where you're allowed to have something which has negative mass or positive mass for, for, um, for an attraction or repulsion between particles. So, so you're well, in I, I'm saying, how did you come to them? You came to them because of Feynman diagrams, right? You yes. as, a, as a, the physics okay. community. Yeah, and, yeah. and the Feynman diagrams were Feynman's vivid uh, drawings of the terms in the perturbative expansion. That's right. With some adjustments. Oh. What, what we're talking and, about. And so they never had, uh, they only had mathematical reality uh, made vivid. Uh, and then uh, you begin to believe in them as physical entities. But to what extent can you believe them in them as physical entities? Uh, if I may jump in on that, uh, the thing is the following. We, I did a lot of work on the electron scattering, okay? When you do the electron scattering, we, we describe this one as a virtual photon scattering of a target material which you got there. And what it does is the virtual concept gives you a very beautiful power. That is, you can change the energy transfer and momentum transfer based upon your kinematic conditions. I can make a mental picture, I can draw the Feynman diagram, I can define what kind of energy transfer and momentum transfer I can combine, combinations I can study, to make a particular uh, parameter, particular observable, in fact. With the, with the real photons, you cannot do that. With the real photons, the moment you define your energy uh, 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 transfer, your momentum transfer is also fixed. See, so that's a, that's a huge difference, in fact. 
And that gives us a very powerful tool, not only for the theoreticians, but also for the experimentalists, in fact, for us to de de design our experiments and say, huh, here is a virtual photon transfer of a given energy transfer I'm, I'm interested in, but I want to study the energy transfer pertaining to a particular degree of freedom with, with very various momentum transfers to see, to study what kind of excitation is happening. I can do that. It's beautiful. It's very powerful tool for us. We did that a lot of work around this. I, we really enjoyed it, basically. It's just fun. You know, this it, is, it is beautiful. Cherry is absolutely it is a lot of fun there. But uh, at the I, same time, then you have to ask a question: what does this virtual particle really mean in terms of explaining to other people or what is the reality is? So mentally it is good, teaching our students is good, practice uh, parties, uh, planning the experiments and execution analyzing is good. But when you ask me a question, is it physically physical entity? I say, sorry. I cannot tell you. Probably it's not there at all because it does not leave. It does not enter my detector. I cannot see it in my detector. That's exactly right. I mean, the, 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 these things are a mathematical way of dealing with. Look, I, okay. Let, let me try and answer the question absolutely precisely and in short sentences. I think what you have is you have a situation where you have a charge and you have that charge couples. Now, charge couples to photons, and the probability of doing that in a charge coupling system is fundamentally 1 over 137. So the squared probability of something emitting and something absorbing is the fine structure constant. Now, we know that, and that's essentially, we're talking about the electron charge here. We're talking about the charge squared, in fact. Now, when, when you come to do calculations, and the kind of calculations which I use this for were very, very trivial. They were to do with radiative corrections on scattering. So, so, so you, know, you need to do this to get the right answer. But you're talking about something which is just saying there's a little bit less energy than you thought there was because there's this there's this emission and reabsorption of a photon. But I think the fundamental physical thing is that charges can and do emit and absorb photons, and it can emit a, when it's under under duress, when it's under acceleration, and it can emit and absorb the same photon. And that's the kind of thing you're looking at. You look at a diagram where you have an Feynman diagram of scattering, and electrons is emitted on one side. That's just the Schwinger diagram that Cherry showed, and then it's reabsorbed on the other side, so it forms this bridge. Now you need those things to get the right answer, but what it means physically is it means that there exist things called charges and they do emit photons. Whoa! I mean, did we know that or did we know that right a long time ago? And then if you look at that in a in a in a, in a physical way and do that and do that accounting properly, then you get the right answer to 10 decimal places, as Chario also just showed. But all that's there physically is the fact that charges emit photons, that's it. So there's this photon charge interaction. That's what quantum electronics is all about. It's nothing more than that. And that's a part of the picture, but it's not the whole picture. And then to think of it as the whole picture is just to fool yourself. And it's very easy to fool oneself. So one, so one of the problems I had was why does the momentum change and accelerate back towards the electron? And I guess well, gravity explain it, but possibly some of your uh, equations might explain why the photon goes off and then the momentum accelerates it back towards the electron to be to, so that the virtual photons are reabsorbed. Very simple. Look, if we're standing together in a bar, and we both had too much to drink, and I hit you, right? You feel me hitting you, but I get a reaction to that. It's just this reaction, reaction and uh, action and reaction thing that, that you have the you, you have the reaction to that thing. That the fact if I push you, you also push me. If I push the wall, wall pushes back. It's just this action. It's just this. It's just this balance of forces. This action and has an equal and opposite reaction thing. That's all it is. If I may add to that, Pete, what happens is the following: If a, when when an electron emits a photon. If the photon does not get back to the same electron or its or its part interactive partner, then it will become a real photon, and we see it as a Bremsstrahlung. In fact, okay, we see that that's a physical photon. We see that one. So what we are trying to say is anything that we don't see there, we are trying to imagine what are the least complicated diagrams I can draw and describe my experimentation. In fact, okay, that's that's basically what we are doing. Nothing more than that. Yeah, in so, terms of so yesterday it's in it's what's inside the box that you don't yeah, see exactly. yeah, inside the box which you don't see i can draw the diagram to say the photon came and it, it, an electron is passing by and it emitted and re-emitted the reabsorbed the radiation and then still came back with the same thing and interacted with them so i can make all kinds of pictures that i can make 
and always you are trying to do the least possible, least complicated diagrams, lowest order perturbations to see how far you can get with them. And then when you cannot get there, then of course you are trying to draw that. I used to have friends, in, but I used to in the conferences. In fact, there used to there was a guy called uh, uh, Jamak Lage in France, and there was a guy from Spain. In fact, they used to fight a lot in the conference. Why do you stop at those diagrams? Why don't you put more diagrams? I can draw many more diagrams. In fact, and the answer is I stop when I can fit my data. That's basically you know. So one of the excuses which you got. So basically, what we are trying to say is it's more phenomenological, phenomenology driven concept which we are trying to do. And then again, you use the Wokam's razor and put in the least possible complications. That's all we're doing. Any more questions on the Oh, yes. The whole thing was about the, uh, the Higgs boson. Am I right that the Higgs boson, uh, the Higgs boson contributes mass to the electron by exchange of uh, Higgs, Higgs particles? Higgs, Higgs, Higgs bosons is what gives the electron its mass and that the spin of the electron switches back and forth as it goes through space. Is that right? <laughs> Higgs boson has got the mass of 126 GV if I take these guys very seriously. And then I don't know why the poor electron has <laughs> the mass of this one indeed. And, uh, the, uh, and then you look at the, uh, the uh, um, like I said, mass itself has really no uh, uh, important play in particle physics, except for uh, nominal masses that you put in the particle data books, because I allow for all the virtual masses. Electrons inside the medium are not really uh, real electrons. They got masses, whatever you want to give that. So making a big story about mass being an important thing that we have to uncover, discover this one, it is another way of uh, uh, keeping us in business, I think. So I, I'm very skeptical about the purpose of Higgs boson, and that's what exactly I started off for many, many years ago. To these people who believe in the Higgs Higgs boson. Isn't there yeah. theory that it's the exchange of Higgs bosons flipping the spin of the electron, which is causing the mass of the electron? No, Pete, what they're saying is the following. Like I said in, in my talk, what they said, okay, if you tell me the mass of an electron is going to 0 0.511 MeV, then they say, okay, the Higgs interaction with this particle is going to 0 0.511 MeV. If it's the proton mass is 1836 times of that one, they say, oh yeah, that's 1836 times the mass of this one. And if you say the mass of uh, some other particle is so much, they'll say so many times. But this is prescriptive. There's nothing really to verify other statement. There's nothing in the world that will tell me that these guys are telling me is, is really a fact that's what's happening in nature. Nothing. It has no use. I think I'm just trying to remember if I recall it correctly, what they're saying is the explanation of the mass. I mean, the explanation of why the electron cannot be accelerated to the speed of light, as opposed to John's theory where it's a photon going around in a loop, so you can't possibly get it at the speed of light. According to their theory, the mass of the electron is coming from the interaction with the Higgs field by the Higgs bosons, correct? Well, I, I think the thing is that I, I think those people themselves are a little bit confused and divided about exactly how this thing works. So I think commenting on something which is perhaps not working precisely correctly or trying to say exactly what those people are thinking, they have to account for themselves about how they're thinking. You can't say to somebody else how and why they're thinking what they're thinking when it doesn't really make very much sense to me as to how... I was thinking. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I think that, that's, that's, a, that's a subject that we need to ask some of them, whoever the hell they are. Yeah, it's uh, you know, it's funny the way you know, the, the way it, it worked out. Um, the asymptotic freedom, and then the, by pointing out the what's called the, the the Mexican hat potential shape. In fact, I used to make joke out of that. You know, God one day wore his Mexican hat, and then, then he said, "I'm going to make the universe out of that," and got this potential. In fact, so but the thing is, so that that is uh, it's very nice uh, imagery for uh, people who are not involved, I guess. But you ask a question as to what does this really mean? And even talk about the predictive power. What is the predictive power of this model? Nothing. Zero. Zilch. Zippo. Neutron mass is the, just about the proton mass. Okay, it's a, not a charged particle, but it still interacts about the same order of magnitude as the proton is concerned. Why is it so? No, no, no reason. I, I, I would suggest that it's probably more constructive to not think too much about that and instead watch some more of Viv's talks. Yeah. <laughs> because... <laughs> 
<laughs> I like the loose question as to what should we do with where, where, where from where we <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. So that's what I'm struggling with. In fact, Lou asked me that question: what is going to happen in the future? What are we going to do? I don't know. This is, but uh, somehow I know many students, young people, come very excited and very ambitious to to uncover the mysteries of nature. That's what they're told, and we don't want to disappoint them. But then there should be some some amount of reality check. I think. For them also, as to what what this is all about. Charlie, what I do with my students, I invite them to listen to your talk. Oh, for me? <laughs> oh, <dang>. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what the reaction is going to be like, but we'll see. Any, and that's. But what <laughs> I concerned is you now that um, I thought that at least somebody, some people will respond to this book which you published, but the people are very really quiet. Nobody wants to even. Jerry, um, Arnie and I had a talk at 4 a.m. my time this morning. Uh huh. And we decided that there is absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be a publisher of books. What we can do is we can stick them out on Amazon. So, but the, we do them through Quicycle, that we can print things through Quicycle. No, no, I did not pay anything for this book, though. I should say that. How, how have you actually published it? No, no, this is a, a publisher came to me. And then we, we get the royalty also on this one. We got a little bit, we made about hundred bucks. Already, it's already sorted. But are uh, we allowed? Are we allowed to post the book on Quicycle? Can we? I I can ask uh, my publisher. I don't think oh, that we direct them to your publisher. We can put a note yeah. on saying this book is available from such and such a publisher. Um, go and have a look. If you want to do that, I'm very pleased to set oh, it up. Thank you, thank you. No, it's it's available on Amazon. It's Amazon on Root Legit, Amazon everywhere. In fact, it's many places we sell. It's available. So, the, the electronic version also available. Send me the info and we'll attach it oh, to absolutely. you. Absolutely. Like I said, uh, uh, yeah. but they approached me and then um, and I was very pleased with that. To, I talked for a couple of weeks and I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And good. then uh, and produce it. Thank you for offering that. that. That's very wonderful. That's a very, very good news for us indeed. It goes for everybody. If anyone wants to stick anything up. Yeah. Have you put Stephen's PhD dissertation up on your website? I, I remember Stephen's. Oh. Your PhD student. Uh, that's a very good point, and yes, we should put it up. Yes, uh, I'll ask Stephen if that's okay, but I think that that will be okay. Yep, I have it here. So, um, so I have it here actually. Just a minute. It's under a large pile of black currants. Oops, I just took off my black currants. <laughs> I, re I remember starting to try to to dissect it, and then I I've misplaced it. So if it was on the website, it'd be more convenient. So uh, here it is. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot of um. Yeah, no, I uh, I'll ask him. I'll see if we can stick up a, P a PDF. I think there's no reason why we shouldn't. I have to check what Glasgow Uni allows, but I think it's probably okay. Thanks. I'll, I'll look into it, Pete. That's a good reminder. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're you're right. That's something that we should put up too. Hmm. Okay. Right, gentlemen, I think that's enough for the time being. Okay. Thank you, Good. gentlemen. I really appreciated uh, this opportunity. And then, uh, Terry, that was a, that was fantastic, and thank oh. you very much indeed. That was just tremendous, and uh, and uh, and uh, a very nice expose, very beautifully done. Are you happy with putting it up onto uh, YouTube? I think it was absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank I, you. I, I think it was fine. I think that'll come across very well. You managed. At one stage, you went at almost the speed of light, but you managed to. <laughs> <laughs> you managed. Almost you... not quite, right? <laughs> almost not quite because I'm still a material particle. So. <laughs>